The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to ReproAction's Act and Learn webinar for March 2023. We have an incredibly serious and important topic to bring to you today. It is about violence and the movement that dares to call itself pro-life. And we have titled this A Call to Arms, Violence and the Pro-Life Movement. So first up, we'll introduce your hosts from the ReproAction team. I am Erin Matson. I use she, her pronouns. I am co-founder and executive director of ReproAction. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I am on Twitter at Erin to the Max, and I'll pass it over to my other co-host to introduce himself. Thank you, Erin. My name is Kara Mailman. My pronouns are they and he. I am the chief research analyst at ReproAction based out of Northern Virginia. And my Twitter handle is at Kara Mailman. Awesome. Thank you, Kara. Um, so our agenda, we're going to introduce um, ReproAction. Then um, Kara is going to give an overview of anti-abortion violence past and present. It's not going to be pretty, but it will be information packed. Um, and what I mean not by not pretty is what they are doing. Um, Kara has assembled things uh, very succinctly. So look forward to sharing that with y'all. Uh, then we will do a panel discussion and we will be joined by Mila Johns, a clinic escort and terrorism researcher, Mike Scheinberg, director of marketing and business development for the Falls Church Healthcare Center, and Alex DeBranco, who is the executive director of the Institute for Research on Male Supremacism. Then we'll go from there to next steps, and then we'll go into Q&A. Um, so first, to uh, talk a little bit about ReproAction, the organization hosting this webinar, we lead bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're proud of our left flank analysis. We're known for our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, whether they're traditionally considered allies or opposition. And we have a deep commitment to nonviolent direct action as one of the tools in our toolbox. One additional thing that I'll add as a point of privilege is that we are um, we uh, spend a great deal of time um, monitoring the anti-abortion hate movement in the United States. And so um, I'm really excited to kick it over um, to Kara, who will now lead us through um, through their overview. Um, and you're free to live tweet if you'd like to do that. Hashtag ReproAction will also be tweeting out from our account at ReproAction on Twitter. So pass it over to Kara. Thank you, Erin. So I want to start off by saying that this is not a comprehensive look at the history of anti-abortion violence, because if I were to do that, we would be here all day um, because anti-abortion activists have an extraordinarily long history of using violence to further their regressive goals. Uh, this covers many different types of violence from invading abortion clinics to murdering providers, staff, and patients. Anti-abortion activists have repeatedly shown that they are willing to go to any lengths to advance their violent cause. Some key examples, um, and I will talk about some other statistics on the next slide, but for right now, some key examples. Uh, we have what is known as the Summer of Mercy. Uh, this was a multi-month long uh, series of clinic invasions and protests led by Operation Rescue that brought thousands of anti-abortion activists to Wichita, Kansas. Uh, these anti-abortion activists would physically block access to clinics and focus specifically on the clinic of Dr. George Tiller. And if that name sounds familiar to you, that is because Dr. George Tiller is an abortion provider who was later murdered by anti-abortion activists. Another example of anti-abortion violence is what's called the Nuremberg Files. This was the name of a website created by anti-abortion activists to track abortion providers. And while anti-abortion activists attempted to claim that this was not being done to incite or encourage violence, uh, the site included names, photos, addresses, and information about providers' families and actively encouraged stalking these providers. Uh, so they were very intentionally targeting these providers. And when one had been killed, the website would do like a circle and cross through through their name. So actively tracking the violence committed against abortion providers. Next slide, please. 
So some statistics on anti-abortion violence, and this will cover more types of anti-abortion violence. Um, at least 11 abortion providers, clinic staff, clinic escorts, and patients have been murdered by anti-abortion activists since we've really started tracking this violence. According to the latest report from the National Abortion Federation, violence against abortion clinics has dramatically increased just since 2018. Uh, so from this report, between 2018 and 2021, uh, assaults increased from 15 per year to 123 per year. Stalking just between 2020 and 2021 has increased 600%. Clinic invasions have increased by 129%. Uh, the number of either hoax devices that were believed to be bombs or suspicious packages um, have, being left at clinics have increased significantly. So there were four in 2018 and 71 in 2021. And bomb threats saw an 80% increase in comparison to previous years. And I just want to note, these are, again, statistics from 2021. So this does not reflect any violence that has occurred since the fall of Roe v. Wade or the return of the so-called rescue movement, which leads clinic invasions across the country. So just real quick, I want to talk about the anti-abortion response to this violence. Um, and the primary response for years now has been denial. So they claim that whether this is them claiming that uh, they don't agree with this violence or that they condemn this violence or that uh, abortion providers are, are skewing and inflating statistics of this violence. Uh, Anti-abortion activists are committed to denying both their uh, involvement in, encouragement of, and like even just the reality of this violence. But recently they've started pivoting and play, doing what I'm calling playing the reverse card. Uh, so many anti-abortion activists are now attempting to claim that they are the ones who are victims of violence, framing themselves as being persecuted, not only by society and pro-abortion activists, but also by the federal government. Um, to be really blunt, this is a ridiculous claim. Uh, it directly mirrors bogus anti-abortion claims of censorship that we've been debunking for years. Um, and at the end of the day, no matter what they try to claim, uh, the anti-abortion movement is not a victim. They are a violent aggressor. Thank you, Kara, for that um, for that extremely comprehensive overview and disturbing overview. Um, I am. Uh, I want to encourage anyone with questions for Kara or questions for. Um, any of our panelists, you can put them into the questions tab at any time during this presentation, and we'll get to as many as possible of the uh, questions at the end. So um, if you have questions for Kara, feel free to put them in the question tab now. Um, I'm now extremely excited uh, to introduce um, our first panelist, Mike Scheinberg, uh, who uses he, him pronouns, and is the operations director at the Falls Church Healthcare Center in Falls Church. Virginia, um, one of only three independent abortion providers in Northern Virginia. He began advocating for abortion access and reproductive freedom as a volunteer clinic escort who helped facilitate access for patients and their companions to clinics in the DC area amidst harassment from anti-choice protesters. In 2019, Mike traveled to abortion clinics in 13 states to study the interactions between protesters and defenders in areas hostile toward abortion. Mike lives in Alexandria, Virginia with his spouse, Kyra, their 20-year-old son, and two cats, Steve and Rutherford, amazing cat names, by the way, Mike, who are committed to smashing the patriarchy as well as anything else sitting on a high shelf. Um, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having this and uh, for having me. Yeah, just delighted um, to talk with you as always. So um, as mentioned in your bio, you um, work at Falls Church Healthcare um, Center. And can you talk to us about the challenges of working at an abortion clinic in a country where anti-abortion violence is often not taken seriously by both law enforcement and state officials? Absolutely. Um, I guess the first thing to mention is that uh, you never have anybody who seems to be um, 
seems to be protesting in front of one's dentist's office or one's uh, podiatrist. This is something which is a very, very different um, mode of, of <laughs> just a, a very, very different environment that you would have for any other type of medical office uh, that you have here. So we even just start out as being on more high alert. Um, because we do have these protesters, but I think that part of it is not necessarily just having protesters who are in front of the, the building. That's not really part of it. Most of it is really making sure that our patients and our staff feel safe. And sure, the, you know, our, our um, hour of protesters might not be able to get inside the building perhaps, uh, but it's really the nuance of, you know, will, will they be seen coming into the building? Will they, uh, will uh, anybody know who they are? It's um, really just more focus on our patients who want to be left alone and our staff who want to be left alone as well. So coming into our space means that they need to come into a space where they are safe and where they feel safe, where they know that this is something which they can feel protected from this outside um annoyance, which, which seems to be happening as well. But I mean, we also ne need to make sure that we are working very, very closely with our own security and our own safety uh, from a physical sense, which means making sure that we screen our patients who are actually coming into the building itself, into the uh, office itself, making sure that nobody is there who should not be there. Um, so it's really just a lot of vigilance on our part, which uh, you don't necessarily see with any other type of doctor's office in the United States. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's absurd that th this is the amount of vigilance that is required um, and that it's it's truly not uh, something that's experienced anywhere else. And um, I also just want to appreciate all that you know as well in your experience as a clinic escort and your rich history in that work. Um, so tell us about how increasing anti-abortion violence across the country has impacted both your clinics and your patients? Sure, I think the most important thing is that uh, it really has emboldened uh, anti-choice protesters in front of our clinic, meaning that they now feel like they have more of an opportunity to be able to say whatever they want to, to be able to toe the line legally and to be able to toe the line with what they're going to uh, get out there when it comes down to intimidating tactics. Um, I think that that in itself becomes one of the more um, scary things out there, especially for our increased patient load of patients who are coming from hostile states, states hostile to abortion, who are used to and who have seen a lot of the different uh, aggression out there uh, in front of their own clinics in their own states. We're in the Washington DC area, which relatively speaking is, uh, is not going to be as aggressive as some of these other areas that really have been hostile towards abortion, such as areas in the in the South, uh, in Tennessee and Alabama, which don't which no longer have abortion providers. Uh, but you know, in DC we have a more progressive community. That said, it's not necessarily something that our patients really do know about because our patients are coming from places where it really has been hostile and aggressive. Um, because of the protesters who are out there on a regular basis, we do still have patients who are coming in or actually calling us up, asking us if abortion is still legal in our state, which it is. Um, so I think that part of that is also the narrative that they provide as well. Um, for them being out there, it you know they they sometimes provide that narrative of is this actually something which is really legal to do? It um, makes our patients second guess, which they really should not be doing because this is something which is available and accessible to them as much as possible, and we want to make sure that they're aware of that. Thank you so much, Mike. And it's just horrible that patients have to encounter this violence outside of clinics when they're seeking legitimate health care to move forward in their bodies and lives. And what you know, I know you know this as a longtime clinic escort and um, and also staff. Why is it so important to maintain peace for people who are seeking health care? I think it's important for people to remain, to um, maintain peace because this is something which people don't necessarily want other people in their business about. Uh, this comes down to a, an argument that people have in terms of, do we, do we want people who are cheering, good for you if they're coming in for any kind of abortion care? Uh, we don't, this is not something where we really want to put people on display. 
Um, so I think that keeping the peace means making sure that people have the same opportunities that they would have coming to any other doctor's appointment. Uh, and that means making sure that things are de-escalated, making sure that when they're pulling into the parking lot, that they're not feeling like they are being watched. Um, and I think that that peace and calamity is, is what we're really focusing on when they come into our clinic too. Um, making sure that people are not seeing well, actually not hearing. We have a lot of great soundproofing here as well, uh, but making sure that, uh, you know, this is something which, once again, is peaceful and it's a setting where they feel like this is safe for them to be able to make their own choices and not be intimidated by others. Thank you so much for that. I think that it's critical that we keep at top of mind that it's the patient experience that matters. And we need to hold that patients should feel safe and secure in getting the care that they need and being treated with expert, compassionate care with abortion providers who are and clinic staff and um, who are heroes. And just that importance, I just want to underscore that importance of de-escalation and really keeping in our minds the most important thing is supporting those individual patients who are, you know, trying to seek expert compassionate care um, and need it in a timely basis. Um, so I, I suspect you'll love this question because we've got, um, we've got almost a hundred people on the line who are very plugged in and care a lot about abortion access. And you're in the local clinics standpoint. So what can these people on the call be doing to better support their local clinics during this time of not just increased violence, but during this time of horrible assaults on abortion access in this country? How can we um, support our local clinics and the communities that you serve and keep that front and center? That is a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, part of it, there, there's really a lot of different things. Usually what I, my main go-to is that um, abortion has become less accessible to many people for whom it may have been legal, but not necessarily as accessible because of the finances, because of the uh, practical support. So supporting one's uh, local abortion funds and practical support groups, I think is really very crucial. And I know that a lot of times it's just people asking for money, um, which sometimes is really very, very helpful. Uh, patients who are coming from out of state, they're coming, not only is it that they need to pay for their abortion care, but also their transportation, their, um, their lodging, um, meals. Um, keep in mind that most people who have had abortions have already given birth. So we're talking about childcare as well. So making sure that these organizations are, whether they be well-funded or also just appreciated or volunteered for is really quite important. Um, I would say that also just making sure that your clinics are aware that you appreciate them and you can do so by trying to destigmatize uh, talk about abortion uh, or about reproductive care in, in general, making sure that people realize that this is not a dirty word, this is something which they can certainly say. Um, I would say that something which has been very rewarding for me, uh, which I'm not going to even talk more about because Milo's on the call, but if you can volunteer to be a clinic uh, escort or a clinic defender, then that is also a really wonderful way of making sure that patients are given that same type of piece that we talked about beforehand. Uh, that we that patients are are able to access that clinic with uh, minimized harassment and with maximum security. So plenty of ways to help out. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate your work. It is wonderful to talk with you today. Um, so Myla is not available right now. We may get her back, but we're going to roll over. So if we do... Um, uh, when Alex and I are done speaking, we'll roll back to Myla and to Kara together. Um, but I'm going to encourage you, if you have any questions for Mike, just put them in the questions tab and we'll get to uh, as many as possible at the end. Um, now I'm very pleased to introduce Alex DeBranco, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Institute for Research on Male Supremacism, which connects research to action to contest misogyny and trans misogyny. Alex provides training, advice, and consulting on male supremacism for social justice organizations and expertise to media outlets such as NPR, Time, The New Republic, and the AP. Alex received her PhD from Yale Sociology for research on US right organizational and philanthropic infrastructure with an emphasis on the Christian right and anti-abortion and anti-LGBTQI ideology. She's a fellow with the Pop Culture Collaborative and an advisor for the 22nd Century Initiative. Alex, we are so geeked to have you here today. Thank you so much for making the time. Welcome.
Oh, Alex, are you able to unmute? Hi, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so my first question for you is, how, how does this all link up? How do you see anti-abortion violence furthering misogyny and male supremacy? Yeah, so, you know, quickly, we work on the framework of male supremacism, um, which is the construct, the belief system um, that cisgender men are superior, that they deserve dominance, um, that there are only two sexes, involves the dehumanization and erasure of any others, women, trans men, non-binary people. Um, and we work around this concept of the idea of supremacist, um, supremacist uh, organizing. And so within the concept of male supremacist violence, this has really come more into media attention through something like misogynist incel mass violence that has increased um, in previous years. But anti-abortion violence, which has been going on for so much longer, um, is really one of the much earlier aspects of misogynist and male supremacist violence. It's intended to maintain the biologically essentialist structure um, in which women and given deep intersections with white supremacy, white women are supposed to serve only a particular circumscribed role um, as breeders. Um, and so when we see this kind of violence occurring, and when we think about the impact of, of anti-abortion organizing, it's really intended to couch anyone who is not a cisgender man um, into a very circumscribed posi position. And it is really deeply intertwined with a number of other attacks. We've seen as soon as they achieved overturning abortion, they went for birth control, when we see rates of anti-abortion rise, not just in the US, but in other places globally, it's typically in tandem with other kinds of gender-based violence against women and against trans people and other LGBTQ people. And so this is really key um, to furthering a male supremacist agenda. Um, and those aspects of dehumanization and what Kara brought up um, threat construction, persecution frame, victim frames, these are all aspects of dangerous speech um, that have been found across case studies globally um, to be what makes violence against particular groups more acceptable. And so I think we can't disentangle the way that dangerous speech is constructed against women and other um, people who are seeking to access abortion um, and sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence because they're all part of the idea of acceptability um, that, uh, that non-cisgender men are less than human that aren't deserving of the same rights to bodily autonomy and that violence is an acceptable and even a virtuous tactic for achieving these goals. Oh, I, the, hearing you say that it's a virtuous track tactic, I had to groan because it's also so true, um, but I'm just pained thinking about my own experiences with clinic defense, um, as well as clinic escorting, where I've seen these calls to violence where people wrap themselves as if they are somehow um, doing uh, what they frame as the Lord's work. And it's, it's very frightening. Um, are there lessons and tactics that you've learned in your work and leadership fighting, about, fighting against male supremacy that you think can be applied to the fight against anti-abortion and violence? Yeah, so I think you know, one of the really key things is how much the tactics and strategies and frames of the anti-abortion movement and of supremacist movements really say, stay the same through the decades. I love that Karen Kara brought up the Nuremberg Files 
because we can think of that as like a very early form of doxing. Um, but in addition to the Nuremberg files, anti-abortion activists often influenced by white supremacist and anti-Semitic actors where they learned a lot of their violent tactics from would put up wanted posters, um, a paper form of, of doxing. So thinking about as technology changes, um, there are different kinds of opportunities for how they might use social media and websites to help further their goals. But there's really a lot of consistency in what they're working on. Um, and my PhD actually, um, one of the chapters looked at the use of dangerous speech in direct mail in the 1980s um, against uh, on abortion and anti-gay frameworks. And there's so much deep consistency in persecution frames, in virtue talk, um, in all of these elements of threat construction and how we know that speech is related to violence. And so with that kind of knowledge that we come in with, you know, doing one, especially for the anti-abortion movement, because there is so much connection between the kind of dehumanizing and threat constructing kind of dangerous speech that they use and incidents of violence, which they, of course, the movement as a whole will then will then say, well, we weren't, it's not because of us that this person targeted this Planned Parenthood cl clinic, believing the disinformation that we provided um, about killing babies. Um, and so really honing in on not letting them do that. Um, when I spoke to NPR last week, I talked about just because a particular group is not actively and vocally endorsing violence, mostly because they are concerned about their <laughs> how they look to media, does not mean it's not an extremist group. It doesn't mean it's not a supremacist group. It's really important to recognize that what we call the mainstream anti-abortion movement is itself supremacist and extremist and can't be divorced from the kind of acceptability of violence that comes through the way that they talk about this. So I think that's one sort of starting point is just to really be clear on what we intervene in and to recognize how deep the connection is between speech and violent action. And then the next thing that I would talk about um, is we at IRMS really work on root causes, cultural change, and kind of new ways of thinking about intervention and prevention, or ways that aren't necessarily new, um, but aren't usually integrated with our, our countering violence kind of apparatus. Um, so we are doing this year um, a series of anti-supremacist training and creation institutes where we're bringing together researchers and organizers and artists and journalists to collaborate on innovative ways of changing culture um, and working on strategic long-term kind of change. We'll actually be, I'll be on another webinar on Thursday with journalist Amy Littlefield where we're, be, we're going to be diving deep into the history and strategy of the anti-abortion movement. Um, and so through, what we've been doing in those spaces are refocusing attention on what creates generations um, of people who endorse um, beliefs around male supremacism um, and all that's attendant with that. So we think about things like the really substantial increase in abstinence-only educational programs and funding for that since the 1990s. Um, and that those abstinence-only programs, which are known to endorse gender stereotyping, anti-consent, um, and other elements of what um, are found to be the frameworks believed by people who commit interpersonal violence or other forms of misogynist violence, um, going back to thinking about, we have educated now a generation of youth many of whom went through abstinence-only programming. 
And so when they think about our society, it's framed by that. And so thinking about ways that we can apply those kinds of lessons are really starting at those K through 12 stages, also at the cultural stages. I'm a, I've been working with Pop Culture Collaborative, which intervenes in entertainment media. Um, Answer also has done really good work looking at how abortion is portrayed in media. And so intervening at levels where we can start in something like comprehensive sexuality education um, with really discussing you know, the humanity of people who are not cisgender men only, um, the humanity of all people, that that is a really key element of preventing the willingness to perpetrate violence. It's necessary to construct others as a threat and to construct violence as virtuous because of the way that people are wired for empathy. And so we really take those playbooks of thinking about the strategy. And I think with the overturning of Roe, um, you know, thinking about the limitations um, of, a, of a campaign kind of focus, um, a rapid response kind of year by year, and thinking about that long-term kind of generational span and how we can, how we can intervene um, in ways that are going to change how we think about bodily autonomy and gender expression and liberation and justice over the long term. And the last thing I'll say on that is just to kind of point out that for male supremacist and other forms of supremacist organizing, this area, things like education, working on school boards, entertainment media, culture, that's been a really long-term focus for the right, for supremacist organizing, um, from attacks on sex education um, to attacks on what they've termed critical race theory in the present day, coming at things from an intersectional perspective, that they've really valued that these are the spheres that will help them to, um, to create the change that they're looking for. And so putting our own value into those spaces as well um, and thinking in that kind of long-term perspective um, on humanization that is just core to combating supremacism and authoritarianism writ large. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Alex. And I really appreciate the link that you just made at the conclusion of your comment to authoritarianism. And there's, you know, one of the things that I often say to people is I, so I'm a longtime um, advocate for women and girls who came to more narrow my focus on abortion access and then um, more broadly to support reproductive justice organizing work. And um, specifically, you know, I thought to myself for a long time, it's like, I'm in this fight for abortion, and suddenly I realize I'm fighting for democracy with equal vigor. That um, that when we look at what our opponents are doing, um, violence is an enforcement mechanism that they're using. They simply uh, do not want people to have control, not just over their own bodies and lives, but over their own government. And um, there is no end to what they seek to enforce with their bombs and bullets, as well as their disinformation that they are peddling. Um, we're getting some great questions that are starting to come in. Um, unfortunately, Milo is not able to join us, so um, we will miss that discussion um, with Mila and Kara. Um, but I do want to urge folks, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the questions tab. Um, just a few bits of housekeeping. So um, one, to plug into repro action campaigns, we host these Act and Learn webinars every month. They are free, they are open to the public, they are intended to dive deeper on topics, to educate folks, to offer a space to share strategies um, so that we are better able um, to increase access to abortion, advance reproductive justice, and stop the haters in their tracks. Um, we don't want you to miss an invite. 
and you don't need to get FOMO about them. Just sign up at reproaction.org. We've got email, sign up there on our homepage and you will get those invitations. Um, we also invite you to follow us on social media. We are reproaction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I will answer um, one of the most popular questions we get, um, which also came through today, which is, will there be a recording available to this webinar? And the answer is yes. Um, we will be posting that on our website in the coming days. And if you sign up for email alerts from us, you will also get an email um, when that uh, recording is available. So um, know that that is coming. Um, please save the date for our next Act and Learn webinar. Um, we will be meeting on Monday, April 24th at 12 Eastern, and we'll talk about how big tech is failing abortion. Um, there's a lot to say about that, but to, just to put it really succinctly, um, those online platforms are really blowing it in terms of uh, assuring access to quality information about abortion. And so we are going to talk about that um, next month. And we really hope that you will save the date now and know that that invite is coming later if you sign up for email alerts. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to Q&A. Um, the first one, um, let's start with Kara and then... Um, if Alex or Mike wants to uh, chime in with anything additional, uh, please do. Um, we have a question. Is the Nuremberg Files website still operating online? And um, I'd also just expand a little bit. You know, what should folks be thinking about with the fact that that uh, website um, has existed? Like, what precedent does that set? What should folks be concerned about? So let's start with Kara and then um, Alex and Mike. If you have anything you want to chime in, you are welcome to do so. Yeah, so um, if it is still online, it is deeply hidden somewhere. I have searched for it to see if, because I have the same question, is this still online? Uh, and from what I can find, the answer is no. My assumption is that that means many anti-abortion groups have either A, uh, created a new and different, uh, I want to call it database of uh, abortion providers to harass, um, or it means that they are now keeping these things internal uh, so that they don't have to be taken to court again uh, over their continued uh, active stalking of abortion providers. In terms of things that people should be keeping in mind, just knowing that this exists, um, it's just your own digital security, uh, if, especially if you are an abortion provider, work in an abortion clinic, are a clinic escort, uh, or do work in and around repro, um, making sure that you are keeping uh, any profiles with like really clear identifying information private, uh, making sure your phone number is not available online, uh, making sure that your address is not easily searchable. Every so often I will go in and just search my, like my full name and address uh, to see if uh, my address is publicly searchable. Uh, taking, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to take these steps, but it's important to have an idea of what information about you is out there uh, so that you know exactly what anti-abortion activists uh, could also potentially be finding about you. Thank you, Kara. Um, Alex or Mike, anything you'd want to add? This is Mike. Um, I would say, first of all, I, I've seen other sites that may have been around, which were not necessarily the Nuremberg Files, but uh, other ones that had been also, I guess, doxing um, abortion providers. Um, I don't know if they're still up at this point. The main thing is now, because everything's moving so quickly, it's very easy to dox and run and have things taken down, but still the damage at that point is done, which in itself becomes very frightening because you don't know necessarily what the consequences will be for people who are going to be doing this. So a lot of it is just really vigilance. And as Karen mentioned, um, it, it's really just checking online as much as possible and really just, you know, taking care of yourself is, is very, very important if you're going to be an advocate for abortion access. Yeah, I would also add, um, you know, 
the the Nuremberg files were at the center of a court case and sometimes the level of explicitness and you know we are encouraging you to target <laughs> um, providers is lower um, but I just did I because I do I I track anti-abortion direct e direct emails and I just decided to check in my inbox what are they doing in speaking about so-called abortionists which is their term um, and you know an email pops up from one of the organizations American Life League um, talking about uh, being able to openly kill babies for profit naming a specific Montana abortion provider by name so even if it's not always in the same kind of like full list they are sending to their members with the the kind of clarion call um, the specific um, you know specific information to an extent and then I think relying on the abilities of things like doxing um, to occur more easily in the present day than the ability to find a person's personal information in the pre-internet period. Thank you. And Alex, earlier you spoke to um, the fact that they are, um, that this violence touches everyone in that movement, regardless of whether they're explicitly, openly advocating violence or not. And that comports with what we've seen at ReproAction, that they are all working together um, and that it is a coordinated effort. You know, I would just add um, that we've also seen recently in the D.C. area um, inflammatory claims where a specific abortion provider has been targeted multiple times by name um, in conjunction with a horrific inflammatory set of lies created by anti-abortion activists um, for the purpose of garnering media attention and I would also argue waving a flag for the violently inclined. Um, one other piece that I'd just like to bring up and confirm is that, you know, when anti-abortion activists uh, make lies uh, and put them out and repeat them over and over into the public, they know exactly what they're doing. And it's not a mistake or a coincidence that um, when violence erupted with a mass shooter um, targeting a Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs within the last decade, that um, actually the first thing that he said um, to the police um, following his apprehension was a quote that directly mirrored, he said, no more baby body parts, that directly mirrored a coordinated um, campaign run by a by uh, an an unethical and unlawful group um, called Center for Medical Progress, and that a rally cry that had been uh, shared by members of Congress. So it's all interconnected. I also want to um, just acknowledge that uh, someone put into the questions um, tab acknowledging that Operation Rescues um, run abortiondocs.org site is still up, and that's updated, um, and really um, appreciate that, and yes, um, same person noting that um, there's folks right now who are literally using a press conference to target a provider in DC and fan the flames of violence. Um, so uh, Alex, I know you're gonna love this question. Um, does the Institute for Research for Male Supremacism have an active website so we can learn more about their resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we actually, right this moment today um, are launching our new website um, and so <laughs> so it is temporarily down um, while we do the changeover um, but it will be back up again it's at the irms.org um, and uh, we will be really excited to um, talk about it and our twitter feed um, has uh, links to the eventbrite where our event is coming up on Thursday and also to um, the application form for joining our anti-supremacist training. So those are both still up, even while our website is being redone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mike, I have a question for you. Um, how, as a, you know, Kara shared some tips earlier about how they protect their safety um, online. I'd like to ask you as someone in the provider space, 
how do you um, keep yourself going and um, protect your own headspace, um, knowing that this threat exists and that there's haters out there? Um, because I think even for those of us listening who are not in care provision, it's really important to hear and, um, and to learn. One of the first uh, interactions I had with ReproAction was uh, one of the campaigns that you all had, which um, was abortion is not for your mistress anymore. And it made me laugh because I just feel like that was just such cheeky, wonderful humor. And I think that we're very fortunate that in this space, although there is a lot of stress and tension, there is a lot of humor and there are a lot of really funny people. Uh, and a lot of organizations that will, will work with that as well. Abortion Access Front is a wonderful, wonderful organization that uh, also uses humor in order to, uh, to, to destigmatize abortion and also just make sure that abortion advocacy access is, is out there. Um, I think that a sense of humor sometimes is really very helpful. Um, receiving the thanks from people, um, from people who really are aware, who might not necessarily know that this is what I do, and, and thanking and asking how can I help uh, has also been something which has been very fortunate too. Having um, a child and a spouse who have also been very supportive of this. My spouse actually volunteers at our clinic now. Um, so I think that a lot of that is just really trying to hang out with more positive energy, which has been very helpful. Of course, it's also just making sure, you know, I'm checking as, as we mentioned, I'm checking the internet to try to see what happens there too. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, things are remaining positive about me and I'm, I want to make sure that the people who I work with and who I care about are okay. Um, but really it's that positive energy that really has helped me through. And if any of you all are watching and you're part of that positive and funny energy, thank you for doing that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Mike. Um, so, uh, another question, um, this is really interesting. Uh, can you talk about collusions and collaborations you currently see between white supremacist organizations and anti-abortion groups? Um, let's start with Alex on that one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I did a piece on this, um, I think maybe two years ago now for The Nation, um, looking at this topic. And so when we think about the links between anti-abortion and white supremacist groups, what's really important is the fact that anti-abortion rhetoric is more acceptable in mainstream politics than white supremacist rhetoric. It is couched in a variety of terminologies. Sometimes they use, use frames around protect women. They always use the concept of we're protecting babies. Um, and so this often gives them political legit legitimacy, even though we've already talked about how we know that they're really supporting you know, violence and, and dehumanization and dangerous speech as well. So white supremacists use that cover in their alliances with anti-abortion organizers. Um, and what that entails is um, combining anti-abortion legislation and organizing with other forms of reproductive control. So since they are less likely to achieve getting a bill that would mandate abortions for people of color, um, and ban abortions for white people, which is really their end goal. They support the mainstream anti-abortion movement in banning abortion for everyone. And then they combine that with coerced and forced sterilization um, and um, differing levels of long-term contraceptive access um, to attempt to complete their purpose um, of increasing white demographics and decreasing the demographics of people of color. And so the anti, you know, a really core element of the reproductive justice movement and framework has been to understand how these issues are inter intertwined and how these apparatuses are used in order to get their political purposes um, through the venues that are going to be available to them. And then once they've achieved banning abortion, um, they can, you know, 
work more deeply on the coerced and forced sterilization of people of color. Um, Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, you know, one thing I'd also like to bring into this discussion is Patriot Front has uh, has repeatedly joined the recent March for Life effort. And, um, you know, they've been out there with their little little hand billets where they're talking about um, how, you know, their conception of what is strong families or what they're positioning as strong family support, um, white nation building. And, um, and I want to specifically underscore that even though um, the March for Life president, Jeannie Mancini, kind of tried to say that they don't really agree with that, there's never been any forceful addressment, addressing of the fact that white nationalists routinely show up um, at anti-abortion gatherings. And we've even seen in the past where there was a demonstrator who went outside a, uh, a provider in Milwaukee when, um, when abortion was still available in clinic in Wisconsin wearing a Klan rope. Um, so um, it is ever present um, and something that people um, uh, often bring up. Uh, this next question is a great one on that theme. And let's start with Mike on this one. Um, the, the questioner says, appreciates the mention of the racist element of the anti-abortion movement, um, but also notes that, um, that, they, that the anti-abortion movement will often use terms um, alleging black genocide or putting up racist billboards that say, um, I'm adding to the question, but you'll see things like racist billboards that say the most dangerous place for a black baby is in the womb, which is an attack on um, black women. Um, uh, Mike, uh, I know you've seen a lot in your day as uh, both working in the clinic as well as um, in your work, um, in your joyful work, um, protesting, love that you brought joy into this space, um, either standing in solidarity with repro action events or joining abortion access fronts events or all the work that you've done clinic escorting. Um, can you just speak more to uh, the, what I would frame as the quote unquote anti-racist concern trolling of the anti-abortion movement? Sure. I love how you mentioned that is what, what exactly anti-racist concern trolling. Uh, there, there is a lot of it, and I think that some of it comes out of many blatant misconceptions. Um, one of which I hear a lot is, well, why is it that uh, you know Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers are always in black neighborhoods? Hmm? Which people have done research on, and that's just simply not the case um, in in most places in the United States as well. Um, in fact, far from it. Um, and then also we'll, it, certain things about proportion as well. Something which is also important to realize within our movement now is we are seeing more of a surge of what we call reproductive justice, which is a movement which started in the um, early 1990s by a cohort of black women who realized that the movement itself, um, the pro-choice movement, really wasn't speaking all that much uh, to women of color. And they wanted to make sure that they had a seat at the table and that uh, certain needs and um, certain needs and opinions and input from uh, Black, Indigenous, and other uh, women of color were, were uh, made as part of this discussion. Uh, Sister Song is a wonderful organization, and they define reproductive justice uh, in part as the opportunity to make sure that, um, that families are able to um, thrive in many different environments and that they have the choice to have children and not have children. And I think that that in itself seems to really touch on why you happen to see many, uh, many communities of color, which are really very much into reproductive justice and making sure that abortion as part of it, it remains legal and accessible because this isn't necessarily about, you know, why do we see, you know, why, why are we seeing, you know, this, this amount of, um, of children of color being aborted? This is about what about the choice that specifically people have? What about the choice to be able to make sure that the families thrive, to make sure that the, the care is given after birth, uh, that children are able to walk around their street not being, as, you know, policed uh, in the same ways that, uh, that they are right now? And because of that, I think that we do see that these messages are out there and they, of, of the, um, 
of, of the uh, staff members, um, the black staff members we have here, they're very upset about it because often they're targeted when they're coming in uh, with these same messages, while what they want is to make sure that they have that autonomy, they have that freedom, uh, that they can bring up their kids in their own environment as well, and they can make those own choices too. So it is problematic, um, and it's something which you do find that um, a lot of other black, indigenous, and uh, people of color are also finding very problematic. Yeah, I definitely support those comments about the reproductive justice movement, and there's a many decades long conference um, that is coming up next month uh, in Amherst by Collective Power that I really recommend as an amazing space. I also want to add just, you know, that supremacist movements, the right is heterogeneous. Um, there are different elements of it, the ways that theocracy, white supremacism, the male supremacism interact. And so that's part of what's going on also with the elements of the abortion movement that um, cater to the idea of they use frameworks like abortion as blacks genocide. Um, men's rights movements don't want to ban abortion per se frequently. What they usually talk about is they want the cisgender man um, in the situation to be the one who gets to decide and force the person who is pregnant to either have or not have an abortion. Um, so just rem keeping in mind, I think sometimes movements on the right can look sort of all the same to us because they do all share those roots of supremacism and authoritarianism, but they do manifest in different ways. And that's what, that's what happens when we see some of these contradicting elements um, of the framing, in addition to it sometimes just being, you know, convenient political cover to get their purposes um, on an issue that they don't really mean the message. Thank you so much. Um, this is an interesting question, I think, continuing on this theme. So just last week, there was new data that show, came out that showed that the maternal mortality rate in the United States, which is the highest among anywhere of the industrialized nations, is actually at the highest rate since the 60s um, right now. And to be very clear, it is Black women who are dying the most. And this question is, do y'all believe that racist opponents of abortion rights are intentionally increasing the black maternal mortality rate? And um, we've only got a few minutes, so uh, I, let's start with um, Kara. Yeah, so I'm gonna hesitate to say they are intentionally doing it. They are intentionally trying to increase the black maternal mortality rate, but they are intentionally ignoring the fact that there is in fact a black maternal mortality crisis. There have been multiple anti-abortion think pieces recently uh, that have tried to put the blame for black maternal mortality onto black women, which is absolutely unacceptable. Um, they want to frame this as one being uh, something that like we're blowing out of proportion, like there's not really a black maternal mortality crisis, which there is, um, and then also trying to use personal responsibility to uh, take attention away from the fact that, in, especially in the U.S., the medical profession is steeped in white supremacy. Thank you. And I am going to um, wind us up here. We still have more questions, but um, I, I know that I'm cognizant of time and we're very um, cognizant. Alex, thank you for joining us when you're launching a whole new website today. Um, thank you for that. And you've got all that going on. Uh, Mike, it was just stupendous to speak with you today. And thank you so much for sharing um, the breadth and depth of your experiences within your various roles that you hold and have held within the movement. And I want to issue a final and special thanks to Kara Mailman, uh, ReproAction's chief research analyst who did a stupendous job in putting together this um, specific 
presentation and recruiting the right panelists um, and making sure that we're here. And also just for every day, the incisive analysis that Kara brings about not just who the anti-abortion movement is, but how to effectively and in a values focused way deal with them moving forward. So appreciate you all. Have a great rest of your day. Um, we'll be sending out this recording shortly and look forward to seeing you next month to talk about holding big tech accountable on, um, on all its misdeeds on abortion access. Thank you. Have a great one.